Uh, the numbers have missed. I know it's to do with credit and are to do with empowerments, but you, pair of boys, said, trust me, we're on the right track. These numbers don't exactly prove that. Why should investors keep the faith in the two of you? Well, with respect, I do think the numbers prove it, actually. So what we've printed today is a 15% growth in our top line. That is the highest top line we have had since 2014. A 15% growth in our bottom line, again, the highest that we've had since 2014. We've printed the highest return on tangible equity, which is our primary metric, um, at 8% that we've had over that period of time. And we have had the strongest fourth quarter growth that we have had for many, many years. So I do think the direction of travel here is really, really strong. And the fact that that has enabled us, as you mentioned, to increase the buybacks that we have already done in the past few months by a further billion dollars. So this time last year, we said the intent was to return $5 billion to shareholders um, over the next three years. Uh, so last year, this year, next year. And uh, we are now 2.8 billion into the 5 billion, so absolutely on track for delivering that. So I think the direction of travel is a great one, and I think we should have every confidence now in the future for the bank. Is the buyback, the billion dollar buyback today, Andy, part of a defense against a potential FAB bid? Was the pressure from one of your biggest shareholders, Tamasek, to up this dividend. Is it a defensive move? No, it, it exactly is not. We would have done this whatever the speculation was out there. Um, as I say, a year ago, we'd said five billion over a three-year period. We have consistently looked at where we have got excess capital and said, do we need to keep it in business? If not, let's return it. Um, the shares we bought back last year, we bought back at sub six pounds. Uh, the shares we're buying that now will be seven pounds or thereabouts. And hopefully over a period of time, we'll look back and see that uh, the, the money we're spending now is being spent at very wise prices. And uh, I, I think this will have happened irrespective. Our capital print is very high, it's very strong. So this is very affordable on that basis alone. So you brought up the speculation, and of course, uh, it is about FAB here in the region in Abu Dhabi, looking at Standard Chartered, we understand, a Bloomberg scoop. Do you see any merit, you and the board, of a combination of FAB and Standard Chartered? Would it work? Would it be a good fit? Do you see merit? Uh, we're not going to comment upon the speculation. There has been no contact whatsoever. Um, Bill, my the management team, the board's job here is to run the bank, get it back into rude health. That is what we are doing. That is 100% of the focus. Um, our interest should be in focusing our time on what we can influence. And as I said, you know, I think the journey, the direction of travel that we're on is a very positive one. And that is where our focus will continue to be as we move forwards. So absolutely no communication whatsoever from FAB with you or the management team? Correct. Speculation is 30 to $35 billion. Is that a fair value for Standard Chartered? If we are in this season of where perhaps Standard Chartered is in play as a takeover, we understand 30 to $35 billion cash offer. Do you see that as a fair value? Or what is the fair value for Standard Chartered? We are focused, as I say, on getting the underlying performance of the business up. Um, over the last few years, we have been substantially improving the fabric of the business. We have had quite a number of our businesses this year that have held all-time record income growth, whether that be in China or Vietnam or the US. Um, our Singapore business is firing on all cylinders. And that is where our focus is. The more we can drive the profitability of the business up, the more we'll get the business back and fairly valued. And as I said, that is what we are completely focused upon. What is fair value, time will tell. But we are driving the business performance up. The share price has been responding quite nicely over the last year. And we think there's still a lot of room to go. Your credit impairment charge is $344 million due to China real estate and sovereign downgrades. On the credit impairments, Andy, as you look at the UK and you look at China, do you expect this to be a steady state number? 
or should I assume that these credit impairments will rise and rise materially? So what we have said is the last couple of years we have probably been by long-term averages in relatively benign times. And I think the context of this $800 million sounds a lot in its own right, but the context is a $300 billion loan book. So actually, as a proportion of that, it is still at relatively modest levels. We've said it may rise over the next two or three years a little bit further to normalise with the long-term cyclical averages. Not dramatically, um, but rise a little bit more over that period of time. But so far, as you say, last year was really about two things, um, China commercial real estate and sovereigns. Other yep. than that, the rest of the book behaved really well. No. Obviously, I, I know the business very well in my region. I'm very familiar with a, a, a lot of the exposure that you have to, to some of the Indian community here. Do you have any exposure to Adani either directly or through collateral that you need to inform the market about? So absolutely nothing to inform the market about whatsoever. We don't comment upon specific client situations. Um, but overall, what I would say is over the last period of time, our exposures, particularly in India, which many years ago were <coughs> more challenging for us, um, have been very dispersed. We span across many, many sectors, many, many businesses. We operate at different levels within businesses. Um, we're very comfortable with our position in India generally. If there was anything we were concerned about, we'd have said it today. So I think you can take the absence of saying anything today as being the fact that we are comfortable with our positions in India. Are you pausing or stopping lending to Adani? We don't comment upon individual situations. We continue to apply the same credit approach as we would do normally. And I think it's also worthwhile noting that in India, our credit impairment history the last five years has been extremely good. So um, the, the variety of corporates we service there, the fact that we are more focused upon um, corporates than consumer, the fact we're focused upon many multinationals, it's a very good spread, a very good mix of business. You mentioned geopolitical tensions remain a vulnerability, I'm given to understand, in, in your slides today. Um, and that must raise, you talk about the impairments in China real estate, you talk about geopolitical tensions. We've obviously had rising tensions with the balloon incidences. Is there any reassessment of exposure, of the investment case for exposure to China and to rebalance that uh, with haste uh, away from China in any way? No. Um, we, <coughs> we operate in 60 markets around the world. They are very diverse. Um, it will be rare that we don't have geopolitical issues going on at any point in time, and that's probably been a true statement through most of our 160-year um, history. So from time to time, we will press harder in some parts of the world. We will press less hard in others. I think we have shown that with countries like Sri Lanka, um, you know, we can be responsive to what is happening locally there. We can continue to play our part locally, but we can manage our exposures. On China, which I know is your question, we are still very strong believers in the long-term growth. Yes, the commercial real estate sector has been challenging this last couple of years, but many other sectors have been strong. And also worthy of note that last year, our own business grew in China mm -hmm. double-digit, and the, the income we generated from our China business elsewhere grew at twice that level. So even in quite a quiet period for them economically, our business actually still grew very strongly. So no change in our commitment. We see China as being very central to our future. Andy, we didn't quite get to the easy stuff, which was uh, uh, rates and NIMS. Let's both just take a moment and breathe. Uh, <laughs> where do you see US rates going? I mean, NIMS me up. Come on, Andy. Where are we going to get to in the States? How bad is it going to be? How brutal is it going to be, Andy? Well, I, I would hope that we are, we are sort of nearing or near the top of the cycle now. Um, I do think the most important thing is having tamed inflation that we actually get economies moving forward. We take the recession word um, off the table. I think that will be for everybody's good. Um, so yes, rates have peaked a lot in a very small period of time, albeit by long-term averages, you know, they're not massively high, but uh, I, I'd hope we'd see a little bit of moderation, um, maybe more so next year, and then we can more focus upon economic 
growth and prosperity rather than be so focused upon the fear of recession.